So um, let's start with the, um, uh, the next uh, speaker. Um, uh, so it's Michael Brannan, and his title is Entangled Subspaces from Quantum Groups. All right, well, thank you, first of all, to the organizers for the opportunity uh, to come visit and uh, speak at this wonderful conference. Um, I'm sad that I won't be able to stay for very long. I'll just be here for this week, but it looks like the whole semester will be just wonderful. Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about some joint work with um, Benoit Collins, and this is on uh, the following problem, which is uh, the problem of constructing examples of so-called highly entangled subspaces of tensor products of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And so there are kind of two goals to this talk that I want to address. Uh, the first one is um, <coughs> to try and explain to you how you can use representation theory of groups or more generally group-like objects called quantum groups uh, to build some new and interesting examples of highly entangled subspaces. And the second goal is to illustrate how somehow this um, representation theoretic model, it's got a lot of structure associated to it. And using this structure, so things like Klebsch-Gordon theory and quantum 6J symbols associated to groups or quantum groups, um, you can use this structure to say some interesting things about the quantum channels that would be associated to these entangled subspaces. So for example, computing things or estimating things like minimum output entropies, uh, studying outputs of tensor products of channels uh, under certain entangled inputs, uh, questions about entanglement breaking property and construction of, uh, I guess, what you might call entanglement witnesses, which are, well, for us, just uh, positive maps, which are not completely positive. Okay, so that's uh, roughly the plan. Uh, so my starting point is I'll just review very briefly the notion of an entangled subspace. So it's a very simple situation we're going to look at. So we have three Hilbert spaces, HA, HB, and HE. And, uh, I want to consider uh, an, an embedding, a linear isometric embedding of HA inside the tensor product of HB and HE. And we'll say that HA is an entangled subspace of HB tensor HE if it contains no non-zero product vectors, okay? So if I have a, an elementary tensor in HA, okay, then this uh, elementary tensor has to be zero. So, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that's what it means to be entangled. So it's not a separable subspace. Um, and you can equivalently sort of phrase this in terms of uh, Schmidt coefficients and Schmidt decomposition. So equivalently, if I have a vector in A, in HA, let's suppose it has norm one, then it has a Schmidt decomposition uh, sitting inside this tensor product, okay? So a vector can be written as a linear combination of uh, EI tensor FI and HE respectively. Uh, these coefficients, called Schmidt coefficients, we can arrange them to be, uh, let's say, non, well, decreasing, basically, and then uh, they sum up to one. And uh, the entangledness property of the subspace is characterized by, well, the largest Schmidt coefficient, which in this case is just lambda one, should be strictly below one for any such unit vector. Okay? Being a separable vector is exactly the condition that your Schmidt string is uh, consisting of one, zero, 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 okay? Okay, and <clears throat> so that's what it means to be entangled. What does it mean to be highly entangled? Well, there are many ways that you could try and characterize this. So for our purposes today, I'm just gonna say that a subspace is highly entangled if when you look at your collection of all unit vectors inside your space HA, then uh, I'm gonna demand that the supremum of largest possible Schmidt coefficients for all such unit vectors be some number which is bounded away or strictly, you know, much less than one, okay? okay so somehow lambda max of HA is the, the sort of maximal possible Schmidt coefficient that can appear in the unit sphere of HA. Okay, so the general problem here is uh, we're interested in constructing, quote, interesting examples of highly entangled subspaces. And the relevance, well, there are many reasons why this is an interesting question, but uh, for today, I guess I'll just say um, one reason is that uh, highly entangled subspaces correspond to quantum channels which have large minimum output entropies. So 
If I have a channel uh, phi, then the S min will denote the minimum output entropy. And if I have, okay, so if I have my three Hilbert spaces and an embedding of HA into HB tensor HE via some isometry alpha, we get, as we all know, a quantum channel, which is a completely positive trace preserving uh, map from bounded operators on HA to bounded operators on HB by just taking a density operator rho on HA, conjugating it by the isometry alpha to get us something that lives on the tensor product and then you trace out on one of the legs. E in this case. And by the Steinspring theorem, every such, okay. So what's the connection between entanglement and uh, minimum output entropy? Well, what's the minimum output entropy? S min of a channel is just the minimization over all states, you know, or norm one vectors inside of your initial Hilbert space A, a uh, and you look at the minimization problem over the von Neumann entropies of the images of this uh, rank one projector uh, corresponding to that unit vector, where the von Neumann entropy is the usual <coughs> minus trace of rho log rho. Uh, and uh, so if you just compute uh, a few things for this quantum channel given by this form up here, where you plug in rho given by this rank one projector, uh, then you see the following. So if I start with this unit vector and I write down the Schmidt decomposition of the corresponding image inside of the tensor product, then uh, the von Neumann entropy of the output is precisely the Shannon entropy of the uh, sh string of Schmidt coefficients. Okay? So in other words, if you have lots of, uh, you know, if you have uh, um, a high entangled situation, then the von Neumann entropy would be bounded away from zero. Okay, so, so for this channel here, the minimum output entropy really is the minimization problem over all possible Schmidt coefficients associated to the subspace of the Shannon entropy, which would be uh, some number bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, and of course, the uh, minimum output entropy would be zero precisely when the subspace is, is uh, uh, a separable subspace, so it's non-zero when it's entangled. And there's a sort of naive lower bound for the minimum output entropy given by the largest possible Schmidt coefficient that can occur, which is the S min of a channel is going to be bigger than or equal to always the negative of the log of the maximal uh, such Schmidt coefficient, okay? And if this lambda max here is really small, then this is going to be something, uh, well, potentially very large. <coughs> okay, and so highly entangled subspaces correspond to large minimum output entropy. So, okay, uh, what I want to talk about is how you find examples of these things. And, of course, there are some natural examples. Uh, there's always the one-dimensional maximally entangled subspace, which is spanned by the Bell state, right? Uh, but that's not so interesting because it's a low-dimensional example. It's just one-dimensional. And uh, so... What, uh, what generally we're interested in looking at are examples of uh, entangled subspaces, highly entangled subspaces, which have large relative dimension inside the tensor product. Uh, one such natural example is this well-known anti-symmetric subspace. Uh, if you take a tensor product and you look at all the, the, spa the space spanned by the anti-symmetric tensors, this is, of course, uh, kind of a famous example in quantum information theorem theory related to questions uh, around... Uh, minimal output P Renyi entropy violations. Um, and another sort of situation one can consider, which is, I guess, probably arguably the most fruitful, is to look at random uh, subspaces. So you can consider a natural model for random isometries of, of subspaces uh, <coughs> mapping HA into tensor products. And uh, the general outcome there is, you know, in certain asymptotic regimes, uh, <coughs> well, what you have is that uh, the image of a space under a random isometry inside of a tensor product is generically highly entangled. And, and this, of course, uh, as everyone knows here, has lots of applications to uh, various problems, including the uh, uh, resolution in the negative of the minimum output entropy additivity conjecture. Okay, so, um, so this, this, the, the situation where you look at random uh, subspaces of a tensor product is sort of very generic. There's no structure associated to it. So what I want to look at in this talk is something that's 
kind of on the other side, which comes from a, a model which has a lot of uh, structure, uh, which uh, is coming from representation theory. So this is what I want to look at here. So just to keep things very concrete, let's just start by looking at the somehow simplest non-commutative compact group, namely SU2, special unitary two by two matrices. Uh, and what we can do is we can look at its category of finite dimensional unitary representations, which I'll write as rep of SU2. So this, this uh, collection of representations is very well understood. Uh, so what do we know about uh, the irreducibles of SU2? Well, the first thing is uh, the irreducible unitary representations of SU2 are labeled by the naturally labeled by the non-negative integers. Call each representation HK. This is a finite dimensional space. And the dimension of HK is K plus one. And then what we know by knowing representation theory of SU2 is that there's a way to tensor representations to get non-irreducible uh, representations, but then we can decompose them. And the fusion rules go as follows. So if I take space HL and tensor it with HM, Okay, this is some reducible representation now, and I can decompose it as uh, a highest weight sub-representation, HL plus M. And then it's going to contain a unique copy of HL plus M minus 2, and it'll go down in steps of 2 all the way down to the lowest weight sub-representation, which is HL minus M absolute value. Okay? So you have these uh, representation uh, spaces, and uh, well, there, not only do we have this way to decompose, we actually have explicit ways to uh, embed one of these representations inside. And these are given by what you might call SU2 covari covariant isometries. So suppose I have an HK, which is one of these representation spaces. Uh, and if it appears as a sub-representation of one of, uh, of the sensor product then here, then what we can do is, well, we can write down an explicit formula for the unique isometric embedding of this representation inside of this tensor product. So really the decomposition, whoops, sorry, the decomposition, uh, <coughs> okay, the decomposition here is realized uh, explicitly in terms of these isometries. Okay, and once we have, you know, some tensor products and some isometries, we can consider the corresponding channels. Okay, so if alpha, is the embedding of HK into HL tensor M, then we can study entanglement for the su corresponding subspaces here, alpha, alpha of HK sitting inside of HL tensor HM, and, and you have the corresponding uh, quantum channels that are associated to uh, HL and HM. Okay, so maybe just, it's, it's kind of important to have a little picture in mind. Is there a way to move this up just a tiny little bit, or? It's probably not necessary. So the, the point here is I kind of want to have this, this sort of picture in mind. So I have uh, my alpha, which is going to be a map diagrammatically going from the kth irreducible representation into the L tensor M irreducible representation. And uh, uh, my quantum channel, phi K L M, sort of pictorially, I want to think about this as, okay, I, my, so my row I start with, and how does this work? Well, you conjugate by your isometry, okay, and then you do a partial trace. And this is uh, phi KLM bar, this channel right here, okay? So the input is going to be uh, HK. And the output uh, is going to be a map on HL, like this. Okay, and the other one, phi K L M, where I have a bar on the left side, that is just the complement of this channel up here. Okay, so, so if I uh, input some row, this is gonna be the same picture, except I do a trace on the left leg instead of the right leg, okay? So I want to, I want to keep this sort of picture in mind because it'll come up useful later on, okay? So my channels, I want to think of them sort of diagrammatically, okay? So we have a channel and its complement that we can associate to any uh, such situation. Okay, and uh, so it turns out the representation theory uh, 
uh, in the context of entanglement, or rather entanglement questions in, in this context have, uh, have been uh, studied in the past. Uh, so this was done in a PhD thesis of Munira al nuairan in 2013. And, and actually this, this problem of looking at these channels was also looked at in a very different setting uh, by Lieb and Solovey in, in the resolution of a, an entropy conjecture um, back in 2012. But here I'm going to focus on the work of Al Nuairan. And uh, what, what was looked at here is the following. So you want to understand whether you get entangled subspaces from these uh, sub-representations of tensor products of irreducibles uh, for SU2. And the, the statement is this. So if I look at HK inside of HL tensor HM, then it turns out to be entangled precisely when uh, this sub-representation HK is not the highest weight sub-representation. And uh, because the representation category of SU2 is very well understood, you can actually do lots of concrete calculations. So you can even compute minimum output entropies of various examples of channels. So if you look at our situation of these things down here, for example, if you look at phi k minus 1 k 1 bar, this is going to be a map from k by k matrices to k plus 1 by k plus 1 matrices. And you have a nice uh, description of the behavior of the minimum output entropy in, in, in this situation. So there's a precise formula, but it's a little more complicated than what I wrote here. Okay? And similarly, you know, M2 to MK plus 1, the corresponding channel there. So this is going from the space associated to the basic initial representation of SU2 into the K, K representation. Okay, so what's the situation you have here? So there's some, some good news and some bad news associated to this uh, paradigm. So the, the good news is that, well, <clears throat> you can do lots of calculations, as I sort of tried to emphasize here. You can compute many things uh, explicitly. But the, the bad news is if you kind of look at these formulas for the minimum output entropy, uh, you see that there's some, there's some entanglement, of course, because these are non-zero quantities. But uh, generally, there's not a high degree of entanglement. So in particular, if you let k go to infinity uh, in these two situations, then okay, what's that, what's that, what's, what these are converging to are both to zero. And so this is telling you that the corresponding entangled subspaces are sort of becoming separable in some asymptotic sense uh, in some large k limit. And in general, uh, you can kind of see when you look at the representation theory of SU2, partly because it's coming from a low dimensional group that uh, entanglement is there, but it's not going to be there in some sort of high degree. Um, okay, so, so the idea then is, okay, you want to try and find some more entanglement from representation theory. And what I want to try and sell to you is that uh, you can modify the representation category of SU2 in a suitable way uh, that allows you to uh, still do calculations, but actually get a lot more entanglement. So before getting to that, the initial idea might be, okay, well, SU2 is a kind of small rank group. And what you might want to try and do is, okay, say, well, let's look at SU3 or SU4 or unitary group of uh, dimension n by n and so on and so forth. Look at all these groups and try and do the same thing. So look at higher rank groups and look at representations and study the same problem. But there is an issue here, and it's kind of an embarrassing issue mathematically, and it's that, it's that we actually really don't understand the representation categories in full, uh, to the same full level that we do for SU2 for any of these higher rank groups. So in particular, if you want to look at tensor products of quantum channels associated to these groups, you need to uh, understand the Klebsch-Gordon theory and also things like uh, 6J symbols. And beyond SU3, these uh, quantities aren't even known. Okay, so going to groups of higher rank is somehow not really a convenient thing in our situation. So what, what we'll propose is kind of an even more naive idea, which is can we find a group for some G, which will be like a group with a representation category, category that's just as computable as SU2 but gives us more entanglement. So we might have a, a wish list that you could uh, sort of ask for. So what we want is really a G such that rep G looks like SU2, so we want to have the same fusion rules as SU2. So the irreducibles associated to G are, again, indexed by non-negative integers. 
And uh, tensor products behave exactly like we have for SU2. But we can't be too greedy, uh, so maybe we'll allow for the possibility of these representation spaces to be not necessarily the same as for SU2. Okay? And if you have these fusion rules, you know that actually the, the dimensions are going to be recursively determined by this fusion rule. So if I specify the dimension of H1, say at C to the N, then uh, these fusion rules will tell me the dimensions of all the remaining representations if, if my G has to satisfy this. So for example, if we have C to the N, then H2 would be C to the N squared minus 1. So then equal to 3, you would have a situation where these H1, H2, H3, and so on are growing exponentially in, in size. Okay. And there's another thing that might be convenient to ask for, namely, uh, it's something that happens for SU2, and actually for any um, irreducible representation of a compact group. And that is the trivial representation is always contained in the tensor product of <coughs> H1 with itself. And the trivial representation is actually always maximally entangled one-dimensional subspace. Okay? This is something that's, uh, I mean, this is quantum mechanics or it's representation theory. So uh, you can see it either way. Okay, so we're going to ask that somehow Whatever, whatever this wish list, if, it's, if anything satisfies it, we want to have all these three things. Okay, so, well, the interesting thing here is that if we, if we want to have some G which fulfills all of these things on our wish list, the, the only th group that actually satisfies them is SU2. Uh, but if you allow yourself to consider representations of quantum groups, then basically we can satisfy our wish list for any n bigger than or equal to 2. So uh, this brings us to the concept of a quantum group. I'm not actually going to define it uh, in, a, in a very concrete way, but the way you should think about a quantum group is, is it's like a generalization of a notion of a group. And so what's a group? A group is a space with a group law, got some topology which is compatible with this. But you can describe all of this structure at the level of its algebra of polynomial functions. Okay, so if you know the polynomial functions on, a, let's say, a matrix group, you understand the group that underlies that algebra. And for groups, the polynomial function algebra is a commutative algebra given by some generators and relations, which are coming from the group structure. And a quantum group, we can just, for our purposes, just think of it as a polynomial function algebra, which we allow to be non-commutative. Okay? So in, in our situation, the specific examples of quantum groups that come up are the free orthogonal quantum groups. So if I have n bigger than or equal to 2, O n plus is the free orthogonal quantum group, and it's described by an algebra, a unital star algebra of polynomial functions, which is generated by n squared coordinates, just like we would for a regular orthogonal group, uh, with the property that when I stick these n squared coordinates into a n by n matrix, this should be an orthogonal matrix over this star algebra. Okay, so Going back to yesterday, in Lee Gao's talk, he talked about this universal non-commutative unitary algebra, Bn. This is awfully similar to that algebra. It's actually a quotient, a star algebra quotient of Bn, in the sense that this is Bn quotiented by the fact that you're making the generators in Bn self-adjoint. So it's like Bn plus adding self-adjointness, okay, in Brown's algebra. Okay, so this is the star algebra that plays a role here. Um, and in fact, one can talk about, uh, do a, an entire parallel theory of representations for this object uh, in parallel with what one has for groups. And uh, you can talk about finite dimensional representations and look at the representation category. And the point here is that this, this star algebra has a, rep the, a representation category which is much like SU2. Okay, so it has the same fusion rules which was on our wish list. And in particular, you know, we have a labeling of irreducible representations by non-negative integers. And we have this situation here. So the basic representation H1 is now n-dimensional. Okay. So I, I should mention, so this is a theorem of Banica, uh, which is a very uh, nice theorem. And, and there's actually some more depth to it. it uh, what, what Banica actually showed in, in 1996 was, um, the representation category of O n plus, this quantum group, is actually a well-known object in tensor category theory. Namely, it's the temporally Lieb category at index n. So 
So people who work in subfactors or uh, um, topological quantum computing or uh, you know modular tensor categories and things like that, they, they, they're very familiar with this temporal leave category. So for us, I just want to give a basic idea of, of what this is. So Bonica, what he showed was, you know, if you want to study representations, you, you need to look at tensor powers of the basic representation that you have and look at the invariance of that, okay? And it turns out that what he showed was that this, this uh, algebra of linear maps, which are invariant under the quantum group, are actually isomorphic to the so-called K-strand temporally Lieb algebra at index n. So here I'm looking at K-fold tensor powers and I'm looking at quantum group intertwiners. Okay, what is this temporally Lieb algebra? Well, TLK of n as a vector space is just the linear span of non-crossing pair partitions uh, of the set of 2K elements. And the basis elements are represented by temporally Lieb diagrams. So just for a very simple case, if K is three, that means 2K is six. So we have, uh, we'll have K strands and, or six, or three strands always in our diagrams. And I'm going to arrange them so that I have three points on the top, three points on the bottom, and my pictures are always going to live in these squares. And then you just write down all the possible non-crossing pairings. So you have one which takes top to bottom everywhere. You have some ones with cups and caps and one through string. And this, <coughs> this enumerates all of them. So the temporally leave algebra, K strand temporally leave algebra uh, at index n is given by the linear span of this basis. And multiplication has a nice pictorial description here. I just stack diagrams on top of each other and uh, remove the, the line in the middle and, and connect things. And, and uh, if, I, if I have any interior loops appearing, then I remove them and add a factor of n. So if I want to take this diagram and this diagram, multiply them together, what I'll do is I'll take this picture, stack it on top of that picture. I connect all the strings in the middle. I end up with this joining this, and that gives me an interior loop. So I don't have a temporary lead diagram anymore, but I can remove the loop and re recover one. And that, that removal of the loop counts for a factor n here. So if you imagine stacking this, removing the interior loop, this will be the picture you're left with. Okay, after you pull all the strings tight. Okay, so sort of the, the point here I want to stress is that there's kind of a planar algebraic or uh, so, sort of a planar structure to what's going on in this representation category. So now I'll, I'll get to the, the main results um, in this work. So the idea really is, okay, so we, we're looking at this kind of higher dimensional analog of the representation category of SU2, which is coming from quantum group. And the, the key tool to studying entanglement problems and other quantum information related things is really to utilize this isomorphism with the temporary leave category. And you can get lots of mileage. So you, you can first of all do everything you did for SU2. So you, you have uh, natural ways using temporally Lieb category to construct covariant isometries from these HK spaces into these HL tensor HMs. And you have the same quantum channels you had before. So you have the, the one on the left right here and the one on the right which is its complement, okay? And uh, the theorem is that it's much like in uh, Munir al nuairan's situation for SU2, <coughs> you can analyze the entanglement of these uh, subspaces and you have entanglement if and only if you're below the, the highest weight situation. But what happens in this higher dimensional situation is you have much more uh, entanglement. So what you have actually is you can show that the largest possible Schmidt coefficient that can occur in HK is of the order n, n is the n from the quantum group that we're fixing in the beginning. And um, we have some k minus l minus m over two. So this is really actually the square root of the relative dimension of HK inside of HM tensor HL, up to some fudge factors, okay? So in other words, the largest possible Schmidt coefficient is always bounded above by the square root of the relative dimensions of these subspaces. And actually you can do more, there's kind of an optimality result that you can do here, and that is if, if you give me any D which is, okay, not too big in relative to the K, L, and M, and the N, so let's say it's bounded above by some constant uh, 
times the inverse of the square root of the relative dimension, then I can find for you an element in the image of uh, HK under this isometry whose Schmidt coefficients, uh, the top D ones, are all the same and of this uh, order, namely this uh, square root of the relative dimension. Okay? So in other words, we kind of have a, an understanding, at least in the sense of large N asymptotics, of uh, the uh, structure of the Schmidt coefficients for these spaces. Okay. So this is about operator algebras and quantum information theory. What's happening here is really, I mean, this is working in a, a tensor category that's represented on a, you know, finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So really, it's linear algebra that's happening here. But I want to mention that <coughs> this idea of seeing entanglement from these quantum groups really actually originated from some completely unrelated work of Roland Vernieu. And uh, I just want to mention that a form of this, a sort of implicit form of this result was actually foreseen uh, in work of Roland Vernieu uh, in, uh, on an operator al algebraic question related to quantum groups, namely extending the notion of property of rapid decay, which one knows about group von Neumann algebras, to the context of quantum groups. So more precisely, what is ro property of rapid decay? So we have this unital star algebra, okay? I didn't give you any uh, norm structure there, but it turns out there's a nice state on this algebra, which is like a Haar measure. Uh, and using this state, you can do a GNS construction. And this gives you a von Neumann algebra, L infinity of ON plus, which is the double commutant of the dense subalgebra of polynomial functions. And this sits nicely as bounded operators inside some L2 space. Okay? And property RD says the following. So in general, if you have a, a, a finite von Neumann algebra, you can think of elements of your von Neumann algebra as L2 elements or as L infinity elements. The L infinity norm is generally really hard to compute. L2 norm is easy to compute. And the property of rapid decay tells you that at a cost of some growth polynomial, you can actually estimate the L infinity norm in terms of the L2 norm. Okay? So explicitly what it says is, that suppose I take a non-commutative polynomial in the generators of my algebra, okay? And let's suppose my degree of my polynomial is less than or equal to k for some finite k. Then what I have is, well, I always have that the L2 norm is lesser than the L infinity norm. But property of rapid decay actually says that the L infinity norm is bounded by a polynomial only depending on the degree times the L2 norm. Okay, and this has lots of applications. In particular, you can use this uh, in conjunction with other things to prove that this is a 2-1 factor and uh, um, you, uh, this, is a, this property is also key in studying the L2 cohomology of this von Neumann algebra. There's lots of lovely things you can say. And so the point of connection is that, well, if you're trying to do property of rapid decay for discrete groups, if you've ever done calculations there, what you're doing is you're playing with the combinatorics of the group law. In the quantum world, what's interesting is that the combinatorics somehow gets transferred to a geometric question about how sub-representations of tensor products of representations sit inside of each other. Okay? And uh, so the general idea observed by Roland Vernieu, though stated in a slightly different way, was that actually property of rapid decay in many situations implies entanglement of sub-representations. I just wanted to mention that because this was really uh, reading Roland Vernieu's paper working on an entirely different problem was how we sort of came up with this idea to look at, at this situation. Okay, so back to the main results. So we have this low, uh, upper bound on the size of the Schmidt coefficients that come from these irreducible representations. Well, uh, using this upper bound, you automatically have a naive lower bound on the minimum output entropy of the corresponding quantum channels, namely minus log of the largest possible Schmidt coefficient which in this case is this thing here. So you have some sort of logarithmic growth in N of these lower bounds, which is entirely different than what ha one has in, uh, in uh, Al Nuiren's SU2 case. Of course, you can't even consider that asymptotic there because there is no N, N is always two. But even if you look at these, this estimate and you look at the same channels where we had K, K minus one and one or something like that, um, what you have in our situation as k goes off to infinity is uh, a uniform lower bound which is bigger than zero, uh, which is quite different than what one has in, 
the SU2 case in, in that regime. Okay. So very quickly, I just want to tell you about a few more results. So um, uh, I guess one other thing. So we have this largest Schmidt coefficient uh, estimate, and we know that we can always find lots of Schmidt coefficients which have the same estimate. So this sort of suggests that these are uh, somewhat optimal bounds, but I guess uh, we can't really uh, make that claim uh, in uh, sort of full. Um, there's something that really has to be checked still, but we expect this to be some sort of optimal bound. All right. Um, so I want to tell you about some other applications very quickly. So two other applications of the uh, entanglement estimates are uh, questions about entanglement breaking property. So uh, maybe I should draw a picture here. So the question of whether you have a, an entanglement breaking channel is as follows. So a, a channel is entanglement breaking if, uh, if, you if you slice entangled states by this channel, then those entangled states become separable. Okay? And there's an equivalent formulation for when uh, at such a channel is entanglement breaking is by looking at the Choi map for these uh, quantum channels. Okay, so here I'm going to look at my channel phi, which is again conjugation by an isometry and then do a partial trace. So let's suppose I want to uh, assess the entanglement breaking property of this channel. What I need to look at is C phi, the Choi map, which is Basically, what do I do? I have identity tensor phi applied to an unnormalized Bell state, which diagrammatically, if you think about it, might be look, look something like this. So this is an unnormalized Bell state. Okay. And in our situation, we can choose bases so that uh, an unnormalized Bell state is actually uh, belonging to the representation category. So it's actually an invariant. So what is this? If I use my picture over here, well, I have this input of a Bell state. Then I take my map, phi, which is conjugating. I'm acting on the right leg. And I'm doing a partial trace like this. And I get this picture. Well, okay, I don't know what that is, but if, uh, if, I, uh, if I sort of uh, take this and move things around and do some sort of planar yoga, what I get is, okay, I can sort of pull this string up and pull this string down. I'm actually going to end up with a projection onto an irreducible representation. Namely, so what I had was K, 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 L, M, L, M, uh, and over here I've got, I guess, K. Okay, so if I, if I pull everything tight and move things around, what I'm going to end up with is a projection onto the mth irreducible sub-representation uh, from K tensor L. Okay, times some constant. Okay times some constant. Okay, so you end up with this sort of picture. And the reason I'm allowed to sort of move things around in a nice way and actually legally justify this calculation is that I'm actually working in a planar algebra. So I can actually do all of this uh, sort of heuristic movements of pictures. And I actually can prove rigorously that this is what it is. But what is this? As I said, this is a projection onto an entangled subspace. Okay, provided M is not the highest weight subrepresentation of K and L. So this is entangled, which tells me my Choi map is entangled. Therefore, it's an not an entanglement breaking channel. Okay, so this is the kind of idea that you can, you can do for this situation. Uh, another thing, maybe I'll just finish off. Uh, I guess I'm not going to get to bipartite situation. Uh, okay, well maybe, maybe I will if I go very quick in like two minutes. Okay, so the other thing I want to say is you can, you can use these ideas to construct uh, examples of 
maps which are positive but not completely positive. And the idea is as follows. So let's let uh, t <coughs> be bigger than zero. And, and what I want to do is I want to consider a map psi t, which is, okay, what I do is I take uh, a map. It's going to be from hk to hl, just like I had in this channel phi. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the completely depolarizing channel from hk into hl. And I'm going to subtract some t times some dimension ratio times my channel. Okay? And uh, what, what you can show is, again, using the idea of this planar yoga and uh, passing to Choi maps and uh, looking at positivity properties of Choi maps, sort of by drawing these sort of pictures here, uh, what you can show is that given a d, let's say not too large relative to n, just like we had in the previous theorem, that I can find a t, which depends on d, which is bigger than 1, which is that, such that this difference here is a d positive map, but not d plus 1 positive. Okay? And the idea here is, again, reducing the question to looking at uh, the corresponding Choi maps and uh, realizing things in the, in the framework of these projections onto these entangled subspaces. Okay? And uh, the d here is, of course, coming from the fact that we know there are lots of Schmidt coefficients of the largest possible size that they can be. Okay, I really want to say, uh, maybe if just if you give me one more minute or so, I want, really want to say what you can do in the tensor product situation because I think this is really interesting. Um, so here, here it goes. So in certain cases, it turns out you can use what are called quantum 6J symbols to study tensor products of these channels. Okay? And uh, so here's the situation. We're going to again consider this same the same phi, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at phi tensored with its complement, or rather the complement of phi tensored with its itself. Okay, that'll give me a map from HK into uh, tensor HK to HM tensor HL. And again, what I can do is I can consider uh, a quantum group invariant Bell state. Okay, living inside of here, and <clears throat> what I can do is I can ask, you know, what is the output of the Bell state in this situation? So I have phi complement tensor phi. And maybe I'll end by just drawing a picture to convince you that, again, the answer to this question, you can answer it explicitly using the fact that we're working in some planar representation category. So I have phi complement tensor phi of an unnormalized Bell state. What is that? So again, I have my, uh, well, okay. I would actually have a normalized Bell state, but I'm just going to ignore constants here. What I do is I, I now have my two channels in parallel, so I'm tensoring my isometries. Alpha, alpha, alpha star, alpha star. And then, okay, complement I trace out on the left. Complement, uh, the other channel I trace out on the right. And I get this funny blob, which is a planar tangle. And there are things called 6J symbols associated to this tensor category that are explicitly known. And this allows you to decompose this as a bunch of projections onto irreducible subrepresentations. Okay. And so the coefficients that appear from these irreducible subrepresentation decomposition, those are exactly the spectrum of the output with some multiplicity associated to, to the output of the Bell state here. So one can explicitly compute this. That's sort of the key point here. So the natural question would be, do you, at least in this situation, get some sort of additivity violations for minimum output entropy or p Renyi entropy? Sadly, the answer is no at this stage. So what you get is, okay, you have an explicit calculation of the output of a Bell state, and we have some bounds, and we can make that difference. We'd like it to be negative. We can make it as close to zero, but it's always going to zero from above. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you very much. Any questions for Mike? I haven't thought about that at all. Good question, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so you had a question. Uh, yeah, just uh, 
on this. Uh -huh. So you know you think about this uh, failed state, but yeah. uh, how about other states? So yeah, that's a that's the uh, good question. So what we can do is basically <coughs> I can we can input any uh, entangled state which uh, is um, basically coming from a projection onto an irreducible sub-representation of this tensor product. So HK tensor HK has this Bell state, which is the projection onto the lowest weight sub-representation. We have all these other entangled states. And in general, uh, we can also do explicit calculations there, but the Bell state does the best, which is not, I guess, unexpected. But yeah, the, probably the thing to do would be to try and work harder and do calculations where you have to leave the category and maybe you get some more spike structure in the output spectrum. You know, that would be a natural thing to try. If you look at some of the number theorems, uh, for example, on L and M, in the prime number of probability, the decomposition of the tensor to the rest of the family, is that always special? <sighs> no, I haven't. No, we haven't considered that either. Uh, this uh, Q deformation changed this calculation somehow. I mean, the traces have to be traced. Yeah. By the trace of the evidence. <coughs> yes, so the, yeah, I mean, when you, right, so the question would be, for example, instead of going from SU2 representations to representations of this Drinfeld Jimbo or Voronovich Q deformation of SU2. You can try and run the same machinery. And yeah, you run into some problems because uh, the trace, the partial trace is no longer uh, an invariant map for the group, the quantum group. And the other thing is the uh, inclusion of the trivial representation in, into C2 tensor C2 is actually less entangled. So some calculations uh, that we've done suggest that this is suboptimal. So really you want to be in the CATS framework. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly, yeah, that's, yeah. So the second of the other extremes, which of your quantum group have hard entanglement traces? I mean, as, as much as they're fortunate to know that they're not, uh -huh. but sometimes some other ones can know they're fortunate. Um, yes, I think well, we don't have an if and only if statement there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it could be uh, the case for you, like at least you know. Yeah, oh, actually. Okay, yeah, I guess, yeah, we can probably answer that question, yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Sorry, I, I may have missed it. Um, can you can you tell me what the dimensions of those HK and H elements in M are? Because that's, I mean, for the comparison reason, I just use it as a mean bound. Right, so the, the dimension, uh, the relative dimension, or the? Uh, the function, something like that. Okay, yeah, so uh, there is a nice formula, actually. Uh, it involves the type 2 Chebyshev polynomial. So the dimension of HK is equal to the kth Chebyshev polynomial of type 2 uh, at evaluated at n. So this SK is uh, given by by this uh, recursive formula. So this is the uh, orth monic orthogonal polynomials for the semicircular law. Okay. So if n is bigger than 2, you have this exponential growth because the oscillatory region is between minus 2 and 2. Because of the growth, is it, is it any better to look at any k l with elementary? So, sorry, is it elementary to look? Is it any better? Any better? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <coughs> somehow I feel, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Mike again. 